Glade Road Growing is a small family farm on leased land across the street from Heritage Park in Blacksburg. So it's in the city of Blacksburg. They produce and direct market vegetables, pork, chicken, turkey, eggs, and more to folks all around the Blacksburg area. And they have um, really developed a sense of community on the farm with, with many different um, entities that actually take place at Glade Road Growing. I'm sure they'll say more about that, but I just want to just uplift Glade Road and also Jason and Sally. And thank you for so much for, for joining us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, this is our first webinar. We'll try not to mess it up. I can't, I guess my screen is not shared now or? Correct, shared. not yet. Yeah, okay, it's up now. Okay. Yep. Um, so thanks, thanks a lot for having us. Um, like I said, we're excited to talk to y'all. This is our first webinar. Usually we talk in person. Um, we're not a perfect farm and we're not a perfect presenters, but hopefully you will learn something from us today. And I'm going to pause my video too, so that um, I can focus on my presentation right now. Okay. So today we're going to show you some of the lean strategies that we have adopted to our farm over the years that have been the most significant for us. That is, they've made our work much more enjoyable, efficient, and productive. Today we're mainly covering the vegetable production side of our operation and how we sell. Um, we learned a lot about lean farming from Ben Hartman. Um, he's pretty famous. He's a lean king. He has uh, lots of webinars and materials. He has two books that we really recommend. Um, the subtitle of his first book on the left there is How to Minimize Waste, Increase Efficiency, Maximize Value and Profits with Less Work. I highlighted minimize waste there because a lot of the times you can make your operation much more efficient, not necessarily by buying another tool or hiring another person, but just looking around at the waste on your farm and get rid getting rid of that. And then to that, I added another quote from Ben Hartman. Um, the traditional farm adds capacity through constant expansion. The lean farm grows by cutting out waste. You know, that has been really key in us getting more efficient. So hopefully this talk will inspire you to dig deep, look at, try to think about what are your biggest bottlenecks and what mental and physical baggage might be clogging down your farm. We'll give you a brief overview of our farm. Um, as Kim mentioned, uh, we started farming in 2010, so this is our 11th year, but we still feel like we're beginning farmers. We're learning all the time and making mistakes constantly. Well, that's okay. Uh, we're located in the town limits of Blacksburg, so we're only about three and a half miles from downtown. Um, our customers live really close to us. Our staff lives in the area, and also it's a good place for us to live too. You know, we have children and it's a nice town. The topography is rolling hills with limited flat land. Our farm is pretty spread out. We lease two properties. The biggest one is about 48 acres. It's on the left. Um, it has our livestock, our main pack house, and our farm stand um, where we keep a lot of, or where we do a lot of our tractor-based fields. Um, and it's also, we share that location with a separate family that runs a brewery there. And um, on the right, you'll see we have another smaller piece from a different family. It's a little more protected from the wind. It's tighter. That's where we keep most of our greenhouses and do more of our intensive production. The only piece that we own ourselves is less than two acres. It's across the street in the yellow box. Um, it has our house, our propagation, greenhouse, our gardens. Uh, this is Glade Road, hence our name. On the left, you'll see some poultry houses. Those are not ours. Those are Virginia Tech's. All of our poultry are outdoors. So we, we lease land. We do about six acres of certified naturally grown vegetables. Um, and we use the remaining 30 acres to raise organic fed livestock, including about 50 hogs a year, about 1,000 broilers, 300 egg layers, and about 1,000 turkeys. Um, but we're not going to talk about animals today so much. We're more going to talk about vegetables. We sell all our products locally and direct to our customers through our online farm market and about a 200-person CSA. 
We had sold at our local farmer's market for our first eight years getting started, but no longer do that. We'll talk about more about that later. We hire four year-round employees and we have three more part-time in the main season. Uh, we provide lunch for them daily. They get, they get free farm products. Um, we pay them an hourly wage. We don't have any interns. Um, oh, and we have these little guys. <laughs> this is our lunch. So um, just a summary slide about what we're gonna try to cover today. Here, we're gonna, here are some, first we're gonna talk about some specific, some techniques specific to vegetable production that we've adopted um, that have been big improvements compared especially to when we first got started. Um, and we're gonna focus on crop health, uh, hoop houses, developing mechanized intensive crop production and streamlined harvest lock pack system. And then we're gonna go into some selling. So I'm gonna hand it off to Jason, who's gonna cover um, our vegetable production. All right, well, thank you. Sorry, Cedric, we're not gonna talk about animals, but you're probably better at it. Okay, so I feel like crop health is a very important step to make everything on our farm that much smoother and more efficient. Uh, they, healthy crops will set a pace for efficiency in our harvest. So we'll be able to produce more on less space, uh, have a better flavor, uh, better production, so less or even no pest pressure. Uh, for example, we are not using pesticides. Uh, employee morale is higher. And of course, with that, we get better customer satisfaction and retention. Uh, our focus on soil efforts um, is solely on building soil biology through the use of extensive organic matter applications and any kind of foliar uh, biology sprays to inoculate our fields. We make our own compost using our own animal manures and plenty of carbon rich bases that come into our farm. So our location was kind of key for that. So when we decided to look for a farm, we wanted to get the free organic matter. So we're the, now the primary dump spot for the town's uh, leaf waste. And we, of course, we get endless wood chips. Uh, all that product we store, turn, and we try to thoughtfully apply them to our fields and animal locations. Uh, we are very fond of foliar feeding. Uh, we're using products from Advancing Eco Agriculture. Uh, the guy's name is John Kempf, who started it. And we feel that foliar feeding is the best way of putting the specific nutrients uh, right into the heart of the crop. So we're using sap testing to understand what our crops are out of balance of and provide the specific nutrients that they need. Uh, sap testing is the most accurate way of knowing exactly what's happening in your plant and what it's taking up. And the foliar feeding is the best way to put the nutrients into the plant. So it's kind of the most accurate thing of what's happening in like the blood of the plant. Okay, pause that for a second. So, um, we, we started by doing a lot of soil tests our first year, uh, then to learn more about the crops, we started doing plant tissue testing, but now we're moving into something different, which Jason uh, cited called sap testing. I'm not sure if very many people know about that, um, but we can talk more about that at the end if you want to know. I just wanted to say that sap testing is different from uh, tissue sampling. And soil testing. And so, soil testing. So the theory is just because it's um, in the soil doesn't mean it's available. And so sap testing kind of allows balances to happen. And obviously you get a consulting thing from it as well. Um, what's important to us is kind of like how we apply it. We've got to make it really easy. We had like the backpack sprayers, you know, that are pump driven, but now we just, as of a few months ago, this electric backpack sprayer came out, very simple to use. Now it's real quick and easy for our crew to set up and use it. Um, and just using an electric battery just to, so you don't have to pump it. Uh, we also use a small boom sprayer for the field and that allows us to uh, cover ground pretty quickly. One of the main limits on our farm was actually the hard water in a location. And you know, if you've got water that's out of balance, um, specifically high calcium magnesium, you know, upwards they say of 60, 70% of your nutrients are no longer available. So to augment that, we're acidifying all of our irrigation water in any of the regular irrigated fields and greenhouses, uh, which is kind of- uh, We are acidifying with citric acid, which uh, we're buying in 50 pound bags and we're dosing it into our uh, system. That changes the pH and of the, water. of the water. I'm not exactly sure what's happening. You should look into it if you really want to know. Uh, but there's only, a, there's only a few options. Another one would be reverse osmosis um, to kind of take out that calcium magnesium. Uh, in our more extensive tractor based fields, we've moved to a dry farming system that uses some to no irrigation at all. And we can achieve this through the use of are mulching and surface but not deep tillage. All right, so hoop houses are the next big thing that's really helped us with our farm. And about four years ago, 
uh, we got into about four years into our farm, we discovered hoop houses, didn't know anything about them. And since I love to build, it was a great compliment. So we started by buying used, worn out nursery tunnels and retrofitting them to vegetable production. Uh, while this fit our budget well in the beginning, we were able to build tunnels for one to $2,000. You know, we definitely had some room for growth. They were kind of sloppy. They weren't that efficient, things like that. But there's three main things we've done to our hoop houses to make them a lot more efficient. Uh, the first is our propagation greenhouse. It's where we start all of our transplants. So we'll do a couple hundred thousand a year. The system is a radiant, uh, radiant floor system. And we're heating that water with an outdoor wood boiler, which also conveniently heats our house. So in our location, we were able to get free firewood delivered, um, you know, basically logs. All we have to do is cut it and split it, which is a great cold weather job. You know, it's a, it's a nasty day in the winter. It's a great for the employees. You know, we've got chainsaws and um, hydraulic splitters. So that makes it pretty easy. But the root zone heating allows us to have a lot faster growth and more consistent plants. And so you can see the red PEX water lines are running in the floor of the greenhouse. Uh, and then we use the thermostat to control the pump. And that's just going to tell the system to turn or pump hot water or not pump hot water. So we're able to, you know, we're not heating the air. It's going to keep things way more consistent and not as much of a waste. So for our propagation greenhouse, it was real important to us. And I might add, this has been our fifth propagation greenhouse we've built. Um, just always trying to improve the system. You know, we started with uh, compost heat, we've had wood heat before, little solar panels, um, propane, and now this is just really good for us because it's also right in our backyard, so the location is very, very convenient. And we also had the best sandbox for kids when we first were building it. So it's always set up, easy to use, which is a great flow for plants. So the flow is just a simple start with a bin of potting soil to fill the flats, a seating area, automatic watering of the flats, which keeps your hands dry. And then our germination chamber was something that we came up with years ago. It uses a, a crock pot when we wired that to a thermostat and plumbed it to a float valve. And this will give us heat and humidity, which gives us near perfect germination and full flats. Uh, to my liking, actually, our seeding schedule is only about 10 lines. There's a few key dates for big crops like peppers or summer squashes. Uh, and then we have our crops that we seed every one, two or three weeks. Uh, example would be lettuce gets seeded every week. Uh, crops like green onions will go every three weeks. And then we just make adjustments based on what demand is happening. So I really like that system because it's simple. There's not a lot of planning. It's flexible, but our crew does not necessarily like that. They like to know more of what's happening. Um, I definitely believe in the theory that planning is essential, but plans are useless. We like to change and update them all the time. And also the 80-20 rule, which states that you get uh, 80% of your work done in 20% of the time, and the last 20% uh, takes 80% of your time. So, you know, find that happy medium to make things not perfect, but good enough. Uh, besides the obvious benefits of high tunnels, another thing that we invested in a few years ago was something called insect screening. It's different from insect netting. And the screening is a very durable product that goes on the sidewalls in the ends of the hoop houses. And so now we have three hoop houses with insect screening on them. One we're going for with baby greens, like arugula and little salad mixes. Another one for cucumbers and another one for bunching greens like kale collards and chard. So the screening of the house makes it easy for us to enter. All you do is open a door, walk in and you've got a insect free, you know, space. Uh, the fertility is easy to maintain and so is water. You know, whereas the opposite is low tunnels and row cover, which are not cost effective, especially in our outdoor location with the wind. And plus, it's a major hassle. You know, the row cover is something you kind of throw away, whereas the screening is a, I'll say, 10-year product, but, you know, I imagine it's going to last longer if we take care of it. Uh, the other benefit of the tunnel is, like, the trellising of the cucumbers. So we're going to get reliable production over the entire season um, and a very long extended harvest of these crops. For instance, the kale you just saw would go in the ground early February. Uh, we begin harvesting late March, early April, and then we don't stop to the end of the year. And it's usually a pretty sad time for the kids. <laughs> Uh, when the kale comes out, that's, you know, chest high, but we're just making space for new crops. So that just makes it real easy. You know, the yield, you can see all the kale leaves that were on that. You know, we're growing 20% of the space, you know, as it would take to grow outside. But there's just no, there's no pesticides, there's no row covers, and it's just a very simple process to open the door, get your 100 bunches and move out. 
So the other thing that we invested in the high tunnels that made it different was automation. And that's both heat and heat ventilation and water. So all of our tunnels have automated water. And three of them, like I said, have um, propane heat and automatic ventilation. I think automatic ventilation is probably the next thing for all the tunnels for us. But I think three houses that are heated are good enough. And that allows you to have that consistent year round greens and then early tomato production. And both of those are very important for us for direct market crops. Okay, so that's the tunnels. We can go over into more details later. Uh, can you go back one slide? So the next question is, these, this just got planted maybe two weeks ago. This picture's from like a week or two ago. Uh, but if you look, the tomatoes are being trellised to the system called a clipper system. It's kind of new to us. It's kind of new to the this small scale farm, but it's supposed to make our trellising system a lot simpler. Um, it's spelled Q-L-I-P-R. If you want to try to pronounce it, you can. If you want to look it up, you can, but it's a simpler trellising system. Okay, so moving on, we are going to talk about our mechanized intensive system. And I'm going to add that we started with wheelbarrows, pitchforks, and a BCS walk behind tractor. Uh, now we have three tractors, uh, two of which are cultivating or specialty tractors. And we chose to invest in more cultivating tractors because on an organic vegetable farm, you know, weed control is generally going to be our biggest hurdle. So rather than having more compact utility, we went with uh, cultivating tractors. So our system we designed was based on high organic matter applications. You know, that's not going to be for everybody, but for us, that makes the most sense. So we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be breaking down leaves and wood chips, which will come to us free of charge. So it's just our time, labor, um, and some, I guess, diesel to handle the material. So we're going to apply all of our organic matter using the tractor's bucket in a small manure spreader that we outfitted for our scale. Uh, sometimes we'll apply a finished composted leaves to our bed top and work into our beds. And sometimes we'll just use them uh, as mulch to eliminate irrigation needs and help with weed control. So this onion crop has been weeded a few times, all mechanized. And then we'll just apply um, a small dressing of leaves and that'll keep moisture in. And, you know, weed control will be minimized. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did, I did a trial in a dry six week period where we grew summer squash and kale outside without irrigation, um, and we just didn't need any water. Everything stayed moist below it. So we were just really happy with the, the leaf mulch application in our situation. And again, with that hard water we have, unless we're acidifying all the fields, it, the mulch is just a real win compared to buying acid or setting up moving water. It's just one more thing to do. Okay, so recently we, uh, we purchased this offset cultivating tractor uh, with high clearance. Uh, and it's got a belly mount tool carrier on it, and that's going to carry our basket weeder. And it's also got a rear PTO, which we're going to use a power hair on the back of it. Um, this one tractor does all of our finished bed preparation, stale seed bedding, and early weeding. Uh, makes it kind of an ideal tool for the uh, critical part of the production. So you can see here a bed of carrots have not been hand weeded because we'll typically go through and stale seed bed. Um, we're not doing any deep tillage, just surface tillage primarily. Um, and then, you know, a flame, this carrot will probably be flame weeded as well. But for the most part, it's just that one machine uh, to go through our fields. Uh, next, which fit our scale and our system really well is this paper pot transplanter. Uh, this tool allows our team to quickly get the transplants into the ground uh, in an efficient time frame using just one person. So we'll transplant stuff weekly. And then rather than getting a whole team out there, just one person can get the job done. Uh, so, for instance, two days ago, we set our about 25,000 onion plants, and one person can do this just in one day. So, the one issue with this product is it, it has an imported product, which is the paper chains. It's kind of messy, but currently our system, it's cost effective and definitely a worthwhile tool for our system. So, we love it. It's great. It has its limits. Uh, soil texture is probably one of the most important things if you ever wanted to get into it, though. It's got to be nice. Okay, so uh, this next picture is just, I, my, the, the mechanical shop I think is one of my favorite spots to work. Um, it's not that I get paid to do that, but it's just really handy for us to have a shop set up to work on stuff that's broken, make changes, and you know, quickly get back out to the field to you know, break more stuff, I guess. Yeah. So like, like we said here, our main pack house, which is also where we sell from, where the brewery is, it has this mechanical shop. So this is not something that we built ourselves or that we own. It's a shared use space and we definitely benefit from that um, shared use. 
Okay, move on. Um, we're, you know, so here's a picture of the torsion weeder. So the baskets go through. Uh, this is, I might add, this is in a picture of in one of our hoop houses. On all of our hoop houses are managed by hand. So we have this intensive by hand system on roughly a half acre. And then we have a few acres in tractor based. And that kind of allows us to kind of always have those quick crops. We can always get in our fields and work. And while we have the tractor system, but we need bigger waves, let's say storage crops or large waves of brassicas or lettuces or things like that. But this torsion weeder is a push model from Japan. Uh, it takes care of, I would say, you know, 90 plus percent of the in row weeding, which just makes it really efficient. You just push it down the road at a walking, fast walking pace, really efficient. You know, we're always trying to eliminate all the hand weeding on our farm because that is a cost that's kind of difficult. Uh, just a photo of the potatoes. Uh, so landscape fabric. Uh, it's a product that we've entirely eliminated from our farm, uh, but it is a great product for some of the long season crops because it can provide a mulch and help with you know, weed control, weed pressure early on. It's something we eliminated because it's a, another purchase product, it's kind of difficult to work with, and ultimately it ends up in the trash. And you know, plus, if you're always a changing farm like us, your bed spacing changes, your crop spacing, and you're kind of set once you burn the holes. So, you know, I highly recommend it. I don't. It's just, I think at a certain point and certain scale, you want to kind of move away from it. But uh, you can see kind of how easy it is to grow stuff using that fabric. Okay, so and honestly, one of the best things we invested in uh, was dogs rather than fencing. The dogs actually work at keeping deer out and predators, I guess. Uh, we bought dogs primarily for the livestock, the poultry, but it turns out that they were a great addition to the vegetable side. So now we're actually ripping out our fences and just getting more dogs. Plus they're kind of friendlier. Um, and there's the pigs too. So, okay, that's going to move on. So, uh, harvest wash pack. Um, so what's this, the most important, most, okay. The thing that we hire out the majority of is our harvest wash pack. You know, we had to have some specialized jobs on our farm as well, but this is going to be the majority of your labor. So anything that you can do to make this more efficient and, you know, it kind of like a self-running system is definitely worth it. Um, it's definitely the number one thing we hired for since day, uh, day one and put a lot of effort into making the system efficient. And the first thing we kind of bought was these golf carts. You know, we had- It wasn't the first thing. We did a lot of walking for many years until we bought golf carts. Like we showed you in the beginning, our farm is very spread out. It's three parcels. Um, it's not in one unit. So, you know, we found that we were just walking everywhere and wasting a lot of time and energy. But we had an ATV to get started with a trailer. And you know, that's an internal combustion engine, which means lots of maintenance, hard to start. And it's just kind of annoying to start it, drive forward 10 feet. Whereas the electric carts, you can just sit down, turn the key, you can creep forward. You know, we've set them all up for uh, large flat racks on the back so they can carry product really well. So they can carry eight, 12, you know, harvest bins, which is quite a bit of product, you know, that you're just moving quickly back and forth to the pack area. So we love the carts. We think they really help our product, our employee morale and just simple. Um, we currently have about five golf carts with for a crew of seven. So generally people are on their own cart. And usually there's a cart free for our five-year-old who can drive them fairly well. Okay, so, so we uh, so we elected to buy uh, two kind of groups of sturdy, cleanable produce bins. Uh, one group for the field and one for the clean wash product that keeps the clean bins clean and the dirty bins dirtier. And the lidded bins were something we didn't get till recently, but really found that they kept our product much better in the in the cooler, uh, maintaining the humidity and the shelf life of the product. So we've now moved our entire system for the CSA packing these lidded bins as well, just different size. You know, you don't have to, we have several sizes of each bin, but you can certainly just start with one size and make it go from there. Uh, in our wash station, we've always utilized concrete and floor drains. We also have carts and mini pallets and big pallets to move our product around the barn in the pack area. And that's been really useful. Uh, these are some homemade salad spinners that we've had since, our, since day one of our greens. Uh, we started with a washing machine about six years ago. Before that, just different ways of spinning the greens. Uh, they're pretty easy to build, um, just simple wiring and using these fish baskets to um, put the greens in. So essentially you've got the orange basket, which is clean and washable, and you just drop it into your washing machine and spin the greens. You know, we'll do one of these for about $75, you know, whereas a commercial grade one's about 
3,000, I think. So you can see that they're pretty handy to us. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna buy in our uh, wash area is going to be a barrel washer with a sorting table. You know, we kind of finally scaled up to warrant the use of it. And this is gonna kind of give our customers like a better grade exactly what they want. Since we're the ones picking out their product, we're gonna wanna give them either large carrots or small carrots or things like this. They're no longer able to kind of pick out their product. So we have to kind of figure that out. Since we moved to a daily online selling and pickup, you know, we do harvest daily and we keep our product product fresher using uh, this commercial grade refrigeration. You know, we started with cool bots and that was good, but this commercial grade is definitely a lot stronger uh, and, you know, really dropped the temperature of the product. We also had to change our coolers layout from a farmer's market style to a, a pack, which just means all of our products kind of have to be available all the time. Uh, this is a picture of our cooler uh, maybe a week ago, um, but, you know, having it all set up for your employees definitely makes them happy. Uh, one thing I'll say about the online selling is that, you know, we're harvesting daily, so we no longer have this really long, well, I think today we have, we have to pick 100 pounds of spinach, but for the most part, we're just picking small amounts all the time. It's not no, no longer so overwhelming. You know, and having the cooler, you can pick things like lettuce mix two or three times a week. You know, you don't have to pick it daily. So that all just makes things easier for ourselves. Uh, like Jason mentioned, our, the number one labor expense that we have is in harvest wash pack. So getting a crew that's really well suited to that is important. Um, we, the past several years, we really hammered out um, writing out job descriptions. Uh, we write it out for ourselves as, as much as we do to give to the applicant or to the person we're gonna hire. And it just really spells out um, what is very important to you, you know, as an employer, what they're going to be getting, um, what your, what um, their tasks are going to be. Um, so if you don't already do that when you're hiring, then you should. Uh, lean techniques and selling, I'm going to cover some of that now, um, starting with our online farm market. So our first eight years, we sold at the Blacksburg Farmers Market, and we did pretty well there, but it was a lot of work for us and it was costly. We needed to buy a lot of tents, a lot of tables. We had to hire extra people to help us with it. Um, when we added up all the costs, it was costing us really over $20,000 a year to go there. And it was hard. And we didn't feel like the product that we were selling to people was very high quality towards the middle of the day because it would get hot and the product would wilt. Um, so we were looking for a better way, I guess. Um, so not, year nine, we quit the farmer's market and we just had our own farm stand out at Arm Farm. Um, we were in town limits, so we figured we could get some customers out. And we did get some customers out, but it was a struggle to make enough money uh, to make that sustainable. We had to stand there for long hours manning the stand. Um, we had set up a self-service kiosk, which you can kind of see here, um, for when we weren't there so that people could drop in and still make purchases. Um, but still not super efficient or economical for us. So the mantra in selling lean is give them what they want, when they want it, and how much they want. Okay, and we were finally able to do this, we feel like, with the online farm market that we developed last year. We had been working on this for a few years, but we never really pushed to get it off the ground until COVID. Um, the way our online farm market works is we built a catalog of what we have, and there are, you know, pre-built apps that can help you with this. And I'm just showing you how we do it. I know there's infinite ways that you can. Our website is on WordPress, and we use a free plugin called WooCommerce. Um, customers order and pay on our website. They see exactly what, they, what we have before they come out. We see the orders come through on the WooCommerce app that we can put on iPads or our phones. And we pack orders seven days a week, typically in the afternoon. Most orders we pack within 24 hours that we receive them. And once an order is packed, we put it out for the customer on a shelf on our display cooler with a name tag on the glass, mark it as complete. The customer then through the app gets an automated, e automated email that their order is ready and can come pick it up anytime. The pickup is self-serve and they've already paid. The product remains cool until they come. Tomatoes are packed on a separate table adjacent the cooler and meats are packed in a display freezer with names written on the bags. 
Um, tracking sales, no matter how you sell, tracking sales is really important. We didn't track sales so well our first few years, but now there are so many free point of sale apps that uh, you don't have an excuse. <laughs> you know, you need to track exactly what you're selling to eliminate the guesswork there. For us, um, our WooCommerce sales, like our website sales are synced with our point of sale app called Square. Uh, the apps make it really easy to see snapshot reports of what your pro what products you're selling and when. And I guess I also wanted to highlight on this bar graph. So these gray bars are last year's sales for us um, for certain months. And um, because of our hoop houses and other things, we've we've really been able to try to level off the sales throughout the year so that we have pretty high sales in the off season, November, December, and now um, in January, February, March as well. And that's important for evening out the, the labor, the load on our crew, and for us to have more consistent income throughout the year. So we were able to do that with um, hoop houses. Let's see. All right. So each week, also a benefit of the apps is that you get um, numbers. So each, whoops, each week um, we make a chart of what we've sold. Um, there's more technicalities to this that I can go over if you like, but we basically export our sales by product into a spreadsheet. We make a pivot table. It sounds complicated. It's really not that hard. The table, it, I organize a table in two different ways. This is the same table, but on the left, left, it shows um, our crops in alphabetical order. So we can like immediately look up a crop if we want. And on the right, it shows us what we've sold by quantity. So we can see what is selling the most and in what quantities. Um, I share this via Google Sheet with our harvest manager, and then we use this to try to pick exactly what we foresee we're going to sell, um, you know, in the upcoming week. So this really helps us minimize waste, and we really just pick what's needed. Uh, we're not wasting a lot of time going and picking crops that we're going to end up leaving in the field or that will get composted. You know, we're just picking what we foresee are going to sell. We pick almost daily, so there's room to pick, pick extras as we sell out. So using this online order system, we feel like we're better able to serve our customers and it's much easier on us since we're no longer waiting around for people to show up and decide to buy something. Now we know exactly how many orders we have to fill before we come in, we fill them, and we move on to the next task. The customers benefit because they now can see what we have on any day online, be able to reserve and pay for it in advance, and pick it up on their own time. Um, yes, we do miss the face-to-face -face with our customers, no doubt. Face-to-face uh, -face is really important to get feedback. So we try to get that in other ways. You know, we send out newsletters. We try to do a lot of posts. When we do see customers, we try to ask them how they're doing. But um, I will admit that we, we do miss the face-to-face -face in some regard. But the amount of labor that it has saved on us, um, it's going to be hard to go back <laughs> to, to a more traditional selling. I'm not going to go too deep into our farm share. I'm sure um, a lot of you know what farm shares and CSAs are, and I, I'm not going to describe what those are. Um, but just a few points here. Farm shares have been a really efficient way of gaining customer commitment and payment ahead of the majority of the labor and expenses of the season. And also we find that our farm share customers are the ones we have built relationships with over the years and who really want to see us succeed. We get to know our farm share customers better than our walk-up customers. And so it's easier to get feedback from them on what they like and what they'd like to see changed. We have two um, main styles of farm shares. Um, one is the traditional bag style CSA share. Um, it's, it's um, you know, we choose the vegetables. It's for people that don't want the hassle of thinking about vegetables and the chore placing orders week to week. We've been doing this style for about 10 years. Often we would hear that customers would quit a CSA if they felt like they were getting too much produce that they couldn't use in a week and it was going bad. So we focused on selling a smaller volume share than the other CSAs available or in our area. An amount of produce that was more manageable for two adults to go through in a week. Um, we, and we also started selling farm shares almost year round. Our main farm share runs May to October and has the most participants by far. But we also offer a spring share, a winter share, an egg share, and we've also offered a meat share in the past. Our second style of farm share is called the farm debit card. 
which is basically a preloaded gift card to our online farm market. We started this option about five years ago, though now it's not a physical gift card anymore, but an e-card in our square point of sale. The farm debit card allows customers, allows customized orders through our online farm market. And with the debit card option, you purchase a preloaded amount of farm credit that you draw down from each time you place an order. This option offers the most flexibility for those who want what products, want specific products and which weeks they want to get them. And when we still benefit by getting a lump payment up front. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. All right, so just a summary of what we've gone over, you know, vegetable production. Um, we do think that focusing on crop health is part of lean because if you do not have a healthy crop, you're going to be wasting a lot of time, you know, um, producing something that might not taste good or is pest ridden. So really trying to nail your soil and crop nutrition um, to have a healthier, stronger crop is going to make a lot of other pieces of your farm easier. Uh, we do that by um, focusing on soil microbiology for a taster, tastier, more productive uh, crop. Um, hoop houses, protected culture has been key for us, automating those where we can using insect screening. Mechanized intensive production, what that really means is choosing tools to minimize hand labor and um, you know, moving out the tools that no longer work for you. Some tools will be stepping stones that you won't keep forever, um, but it's important to let those go when you have found something better. And then harvest, wash, pack, labor, reduce heavy lifting there, make cleanable, um, have smooth, pleasant flow from garden to cooler. And cooling is very key here. You know, you can't do all this work to grow a crop and develop all these efficient systems if you do not have a cooler to keep your crop um, to maintain its shelf life. If you are working so hard to growing a delicious crop and then it is wilting in the field while you're going to weed or while you're taking four hours harvesting, you know, that's gonna destroy all the work. You have to cool your vegetables. And then um, distance sales, give them what they want, when they want it and how much they want. And that will also make your life easier. So I'm not sure if you're gonna adopt any of these. You don't have to. What you should do though is um, really think about your system, ask yourself, what are the bottlenecks in your system? When you look around your farm, what physical and mental baggage is pulling you down? What waste do you see? Physical junk, unnecessary emotions, clogged up space, clogged up mental space, you know, that is just slowing you down. How can that be minimized? Um, and that's our talk. So if you have questions, uh, you can ask us. What? Thank you so much, Sally and JP. Um I'm going to pass it over to Lindsay Newsom, the director of the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. And Lindsay is going to moderate our Q&A today. And I just invite folks um, to take a moment, if you have a question, to add it to the Q&A feature in the bottom panel of the Zoom platform. And um, we will uplift your questions and share them with Jason and Sally. And there are a few folks who may have put their questions in the chat, but if you're willing to move them over to the Q&A, we'll make sure to get to them. So thank you. I'll pass it to Lindsay. Thanks, Jason and Sally. That was really informative. Um, we have a question from Dean here. Can you elaborate a bit more on how and when you determine soil health with soil tests, then plant health with foliar feeding? Um, well, first off, I mean, looking at them is probably the number one thing. Um, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Um, so we, last year we did a really big soil test overhaul. We tested a lot of fields. Um, we, we sent them to Kinsey Ag. Um, there's different kinds of soil test labs. I'm not going to get too into that, but we wanted one focused on a mineralizing rather than achieving like some textbook CEC level. Um, so we did that once a year, or we're probably, probably won't do that this year, probably do that every three years or so. And then we do sap test um, specific crops at certain time frames. So like tomatoes and cucumbers, we'll sap test them like right before they're flowering, um, right before they're fruiting to see if they need something more as they're developing those fruits. So, so and yeah, I mean, you're gonna find out that most of your crops are gonna be lacking the same thing. So yeah, we have specific minerals we might put in and we treat some houses differently, but for the most part, if your fields are consistent, they're gonna be needing something 
and you can kind of make like an all around mix. And like I said, the best way of getting that into the plant is through the foliar. So yeah, we sap test what we think is the most important that can have the biggest return because it's not free. Um, um, yeah, and then we just kind of make improvements from there. But we do try to, you know, apply very little um, fertilizers because, you know, we're, what we're in the belief is that, you know, just because they're in the ground doesn't mean they're available. So, you know, you're kind of getting that balance and feedback from your consultant. Does that answer the question somewhat? Does it? Yeah. We'll, we'll wait to hear back from Dean. <laughs> um, uh, this is a question from Bill. How do you plan to address the food safety issues of the Food Safety Modernization Act from field to the customer? Will this be a problem? Um, I don't think it'd be a problem. You know, um, there, there's a lot of food safety courses you can do. There's a lot of gap courses you could do. What you're really trying to do is um, keep your product clean in terms of, especially like E. coli from animals, from people. So have, um, getting the product up to your wash station quickly is going to be very important, of course. Um, washing your product, I've heard conflicting things on that from different food safety talks. Some say washing is very important. Others say washing only introduces more uh, opportunities for pathogens. So we choose to wash um, and rinse and refrigerate our product and um, keeping that shelf life. Our pack station is very easy to clean and we have a restroom up top also. The good thing about the carts, uh, having the golf carts is that it makes it very easy for your employees also to go very quickly and back to the restroom and wash their hands as well. Um, food safety is important to us. I don't, I don't see it as a problem. I see it as just part of um, what we're trying to achieve in, in growing a product. Yeah. We're not GAP certified, um, as maybe you can see, but, um, you know, maintaining a clean crop is in our best interest because that's what we want to provide and that's what our customers demand. And any of our irrigation water right now is coming from wells, which we test uh, yearly, mm -hmm. is that right? And for E. coli and such. Um, we do use sprinklers, we do use drip. Um, so I think we're fairly aware of the system and we try to abide by it wherever we think it's practical for our situation. But I do feel like we could get certified if that was what has to happen. Yeah, I think right now we are exempt from the on the ground inspection, I think. Like we just uh, put in our application with VDAX. They contact us and they let us know or we fill out something, they let us know if they're going to need to inspect us or not. And I think we're still under the gross amount where we would need an on the ground inspection. Maybe that answers your question? Maybe not? Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> This is a, a question. Could you share more on your insect screen? Okay, so we're buying the insect screening. It's not the protect net, it's the insect screening. We buy ours from Dubois Agri Innovation in Canada. I believe Griffin Greenhouse Supply in Maryland would also sell it. Uh, it comes, we buy ours about five foot tall by 320 feet. Um, and so you just wiggle wire onto the side of the hoop house roll up curtain. Uh, we put it over the doors in some of the vents. Uh, it's very durable. It's, you know, you can buy different grid sizes. So we buy the tightest one, which will keep a flea beetle out. Uh, I think they say it keeps out thrips and, th thrips and stuff too, but, you know, we don't really have problems with that. Like I said, it's very easy to install. It lasts a long time. It's durable. Um, and it's totally worth it. I think that it costs, what, five, six hundred dollars for that roll? You know, so maybe it's a hundred bucks a year or something, 50 bucks a year, it's totally worth it. You know, you just open a hoop house door and you're right in there. Uh, so we started by using it just for cucumbers and loved it so much that we started buying it for more and more product. Uh, some growers will use it in all their hoop houses. They say it helps keep out weed seeds as well. Uh, but we think just to be able to grow cucumbers reliably is, makes it, you know, economical. So Dubois Agri Innovation is a good place to look at it. I think they make it. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Tanner. Have you had an issue with high humidity in your hoop house? And if so, how do you handle it? Yeah, we're not the best growers. I think we've kind of nailed the location in the sales, but um, we're a very humid region as well. A lot of fog where we sit. Uh, trying to keep them on the drier side, specifically in the wintertime. The fans help. We always have our tunnels vented. 
except for those few months where we're heating that the tomato houses like March and April. Um, but we never close them all the way up. Um, I think the circulation fans help a lot too. Uh, we will definitely use drip um, and overhead irrigation depending on what your goal is. Uh, but I have to say that there's a lot better resources on that subject because I don't think we do great. Um, but I would just say don't overwater your house is probably huge, plenty of ventilation. Um, and again, you know, we're not, you know, your houses aren't going to keep it that warm at night, just to heat up in the daytime. If that helps, Tanner, good luck. This is another question from Bill. What do you do to assess soil microbiology? We look at the crops. <laughs> um, we're not testing it now. And um, we're just, so we're buying inoculants um, to kind of spray it out there. It's the easiest way of getting out there. It's kind of what's recommended from the AEA program. Um, you can do like microbiology testing. Um, that would be over our head at this point, I feel like. But we're really just looking for a healthy crop. If you have a crop that is getting nailed by a pest, you know that something is wrong with the nutrition there, which means something is probably wrong with the soil microbiology because that is what is going to provide the majority of your nutrition. So Yeah, yeah I mean, there's plenty of resources to, you know, just keeping keeping food for them out there, you know, limited tillage, you know, with vegetable farming, you're going to have to um, make a seed bed best you can. Um, you know, we're providing organic matter. We use cover crops. We use organic matter applications. Uh, again, it's, I think, like Sally said, it's over our head to kind of test for that. And, you know, we really like the idea of trusting some people. So we trust Seven Springs Farm for our, you know, our, some of our amendments, you know, let them research it. You know, we're trusting our consultants, let them, you know, and we'll just do the best we can that applies to us. But, you know, we're not the experts on that. Um, yeah, we just have to only do what's, what's feasible for our resources. Um, also from Bill, no hydroponics, no. question mark? Yeah, um, that's a whole other subject about, um, I think hydroponics don't have soil biology and that would make it very limiting to something that we believe in. Um, hydroponics have a lot of inputs. Um, yeah, a lot of water use. I just don't think that they're a sustainable resource for someone who has access to soil. Maybe if you're in a city and you have a bunch of heavy metals, it may make some sense. But at this point, hydroponics are not known as nutrient dense and we're biased against them, sorry. Um, and this is a question from Cedric. Um, give them what they want, et cetera, weigh open parameters. Obviously you don't grow some things and at all times. What guides your parameters if wants don't match up with your ecological parameters? Well, I mean, of course we have our own mission of what we want to provide. We're not gonna try to grow greenhouse bananas, but, um, one thing about tracking your sales is that you can really see what exactly you're selling and you can ease off of those crops that are not selling so much that gives you more room to provide what people like. And like we know that people want lettuce year round. So we're really trying to make space in our greenhouses to grow lettuce and greens um, year round. We have just as much of a market for those in the winter as we do in the summer. So. Um, that all fits into to that. Yeah, of course, your personal mission statement is going to come first. Um, but after that, you know, as a farmer, your production farmer, you are trying to provide food that people will want to buy that you want to grow. So within that, of course, you know, you give them what they want, how much, and when they want it. You know, for tomatoes are always going to be your top selling when they're around, um, but we'll start you know, with propane. So we'll start heating it mid-March. And then, you know, we don't really need propane once you get into May. So and that'll give us some tomatoes end of May. And, and then we'll keep a hoop house at like 28 degrees in the winter. And realistically, we actually don't turn it on that much, but that's kind of what our goal is. And that provides a little bit of propane, but most of our greens in the winter do come from unheated houses. You know, and we're not just homesteading, we're trying to provide living for ourselves and our customers so we put that balance in there you know if you were just providing your own vegetables for your own home you definitely don't need anything except for some row cover out in the field and you can harvest spinach and kale all winter but you know we're trying to um i don't know i yeah we i guess we kind of find that balance with some things 
But keep in mind too that your shoes are made of petroleum and things like that. So it's, it is a balance. Um, but we also look at like cost effective per bed. You know, we're trying to shoot for $400 a hundred foot bed per crop. And so we try to get it to be right around there. And some are gonna have a higher labor. So we expect them to be up like 800 bucks a bed. And some are low labor like potatoes. So we're okay with like $250 a hundred foot bed. And so it's, you know, with, I think, um, what is that sustainable saying? It's, it's gotta be economically sustainable, you know, physically sustainable, and then ecological. Most people just focus on the ecological side, but there's the other two ones also that are important. Um, and that's where mechanization kind of comes in to make it so you can continue to do it. So hope that helps. Agree. And Sally and Jason, we uh, have a lot of questions here and I am just curious, would you all be willing to stay on five minutes later so we could spend at least six more minutes to get as many as we can answered? Sure. Yes. Okay, thank you both so much. Okay, and this is a question from Dean. Um, do you mix manure from your animals into the leaf mulch that you get from the city and that you put on your beds? Yeah, we, we run our pigs through in the winter because it's warm and it's a nice spot. Um, our, our animals have like a deep bedding in their house and we'll use the tractor or rent a skid loader to turn it. Um, but the leaves will sit for usually a year or two, sometimes up to three. Um, and the, the poultry bedding will sit. I mean, we just have so much organic matter that we don't even, the main reason we don't apply it for until months is because we just don't have time to apply it. We've got all these old piles just sitting around that we just turn and apply it. So we certainly mix it in. We wish we had more specific, smaller piles that we can manage better. But at this point, it's kind of all we can do to just uh, get it on the fields and try to use it intelligently. So we're not just tilling in, you know, straight carbon. You know, we're trying to use it in a way that doesn't tie up nutrients, you know, more of like a mulch. Um, and then there's like an initial application and then there's, you know, small dressings as you get more advanced. So we have way more carbon than nitrogen for sure, but I think that's okay. It just takes more time. And then um, do you do cover cropping for adding organic matter or are the leaves enough? Uh, we certainly do. We we believe in feeding the biology with living roots. I don't think we're the best cover croppers. And the main reason is we just, I believe that vegetables are a great cover crop too. You know, we'll just seed beds to things that we can harvest, storage radishes, spinach for all winter. I know, but we'll throw, you know, wheat, rye, um, tillage radishes, you know, peas, cow peas. Um, our extensive section will have about half of it in cover crop this last year, some years less. Um, so I would recommend, you know, we have, but our intensive area never gets cover crop. It's just always in production. So we haven't really seen a problem with that at this point. Um, but we definitely do cover cropping. We'd like to do more. Um, and I think what you want to do with the cover cropping is get as much diversity into their into your seedings as you can. Um, that's important. I understand. What tools do you use to SAP test and who is your consultant? Um, you can go uh, so we do that through AEA, Advancing Eco Agriculture. Um, they said there's only one lab in the world. It's in the Netherlands. You don't need any special tools. You'll, you'll just take um, some leaf samples and um, send them in. You'll have to contact them in advance. They'll send you the bags with the proper barcodes, and then you send it to them in Ohio. They will send it on to the Netherlands, and then they'll send you back the... Um, you know, a printout report. There's supposed to be a lab in Ohio forming at some point, but um, that's just where we're at. It may not be the perfect system, but that's where it's at right now. Yeah, I've heard, I don't, who knows what's what, but like you test your soil, you never really know what is already in your soil that the plant is able to take up. So if you're, if you're just like trying to go off your soil test, it might be very inefficient and it might not even still be crop available. Um, Plant tissue testing will kind of show you where the plant is, but if you try to apply based on your tissue test, you're still going to be like three or four weeks kind of behind on what the crop might need. So sap testing is a more instantaneous view of what your crop is able to take up in that moment. And so that is a little more agile for you to react to in terms of um, putting nutrition in, especially if you're going to do a foliar because then you're, you know, kind of putting it right in the plant's blood. And you, know, you could test everything, but, you know, we're growing almost every vegetable. And so we'll just put a budget out, let's say $500. And 
and, you know, just figure out what the best way to utilize that. Um, and that's just a good way of going, you know, do it two or three times for one crop that you think is important. Start with that. See if you like it, see if you keep up with it and then move on from there. Yeah, but the, the thing with sap testing too is that there's really key times, you know, like you don't really want to sap test at, when your crop is at the end of its life. It's, it's more important to sap test when your crop is younger, growing, um, about to approach those stages of flowering and fruition, when it's going to make the most impact. You think of like a pig on the mom for a lot longer, you know, it grows faster. It's, it's a more important time, you know, so, you know, just, yeah, just, Pay attention when they're young. I think that makes the biggest difference. And Lindsay, we can you have time for one Sorry. more question? I think one, one okay. question possibly, but <laughs> yeah. Um, can you compare your propane gas versus wood heating systems, which is cheaper, more efficient, easier? Um, the wood is a lot of labor. Uh, we go through about 10 to 15 cords a year that heats our house and our greenhouse. You know, the R value on a greenhouse is like 1.2. So the propane, I think we dropped like $600 a year on propane, on wood. We probably spend that on labor, but you know, like I said, in our location, we're getting, you know, we're in town limits. So there's always people cutting down trees, dangerous trees, and that's just coming to our farm. Yeah, so wood is work for sure. Propane is easy. The wood boiler costs about $12,000 to buy new and set up. Um, the prop house we built for, about eight or nine thousand um, dollars. A propane thirty, but to heat a thirty by hundred house, the heater probably costs anywhere between fifteen hundred and thirty five hundred dollars, depending if you buy the good one or the cheaper one. If you have the money, buy the better one, like the Affinity ninety three. Um, the propane is definitely just set it, that is set a thermostat, and then it's pretty maintenance free. You know, clean it out once in a while. You know, check your. Um, yeah, any of your electrical connections, your um, oh, whatever, the words not coming to me. But yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You know, whereas the wood is definitely just, you know, every day you gotta put the wood in. So we thought we had, you know, the labor for it, but you know, it just depends on what you wanna do. And Here's then uh, we'll do one more here about the uh, heating in the uh, hoop house in the mountains must be pricey in the fall and winter. Any ideas to lower the costs? Well, you know, what's your cost? Like we, like I said, we're not, we can be heating them, but, you know, we try not to heat them. You know, we, for the most part, it's kind of laziness, but, you know, we're not heating them. And, you know, if it's going to be warm in the day, say, okay, so for the plants, they say it's the average temperature throughout the day that matters the most, not, you know, what the low, you know, so not, okay, so if it's going to get real warm in the daytime, which it's going to do, and then, you know, it's going to be 15 or so at night, you know, you don't necessarily have to keep it at 28 in the day, you know, you can just let it get cold. So we're not really heating them, you know, all that often. And what it really does too, is it kind of takes that edge off the plants. Um, you know, so for us, it's cost effective to start heating it, you know, mid-March, you know, we're cranking up to like 55 or 60, just to kind of get the plants growing. You know, heating them a little bit is a lot easier than putting row cover on and off. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, wind is huge. So if you can seal them up, you know, that would be pretty useful. You know, a lot of times people have some pretty poorly built tunnels. I mean, you can just take a look at most of ours. Um, but our heated ones are, are newer and tighter, you know, better. You know, the double, the double poly makes a lot of sense um, with the fan in between. Uh, you know, just go to one of those greenhouse sites like Rimmel or something like that and, you know, see what they have to say about heating them and, you know, kind of make your decision for yourself what you feel like doing. But if, like if you only have half a greenhouse and there was some lettuce that may or not be worth that much. Is it really worth heating it? I mean, not really. So, you know, if you've got a full house, you know, you've got, you know, your sales, sales are up, then, then heat it. But if it's, it's kind of like your crops look weak, then just don't, you know, 